Due to the graphic nature of its content, listener discretion is advised. From the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli, we fight our country's battles in the air on land and sea. First to fight for... On this episode of Cigars and Sea Stories, Mike and Jocelyn hang out with fellow Marine Brad Ivey. The three of them served together in 37 Weapons Company on two tours to Ramadi, Iraq. Well, it's like one thing I'm like trying to <clears throat> tap into as well, because especially like the way jobs are going nowadays and the economy, man, I mean, like, you know, you see all these businesses that are like, even if you're disabled and if you got this, and then you apply for this job, and then they send you an email back and they're like, oh, well, uh, you know, you don't meet the basic qualifications, uh, you know, you're, you're, or you're overqualified. And I'm still trying to scratch my head about, like, I applied for several conductor jobs for CSX North and Southern. And they told me I was overqualified to be a train conductor. Overqualified? Said, yeah, I'm overqualified. I said, how the hell am I overqualified on a job that I've never done in my entire life? Please explain that to me. Right. And they said, well, well your, your qualifications in the military and all this other stuff. And I said, it still doesn't answer my question. How in the hell am I overqualified on a job that I have never done or know nothing about, period. And I still can't get a solid answer. So that just entitles me that, you know, all these companies are saying, oh, yeah, we're, we're all about vets just to get, you know, a, I guess, a face out there saying we're vet friendly. But in all generality, they're, you know, really not. You see what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. No, you're exactly right, because I've heard this from fellow veterans. I myself applied for one job and got one job selling AV equipment at Best Buy when I got out of the Corps. And then I went into entrepreneurship, you know, but like, I've heard this from other veterans. Like I've heard this from Corman trying to go into the EMT fields. I've heard this from grunts trying to go and be heavy equipment operators. Like it, it's one of those things where, uh, it's all about veteran retention in my right. opinion, and there are other people who speak of this, you know, who who talk about how specifically jobs are being opened up and they create a large pool for entry, but then they're either getting, you know, just come one, come all, veterans come in, low pay, uh, they aren't using them as far as their talent base, their strength base is concerned. And they aren't retaining those employees because they aren't empowered. There's no room for growth. You're not grabbing them. They, they, they don't want your mission. Right. You know, actually, to be honest with you, you know who told – I I graduated from Entrepreneurship Boot Camp for Veterans out of Syracuse mm-hmm. University. It's such an awesome program. I push it to fellow veterans who, who are focused in entrepreneurship all of the time. And uh, – I, I went to the uh, national conference this past October in Atlanta. Bernie Marcus of the Home Depot, he founded it. He spoke directly to this. One of his biggest things is he wants to have a retainment pool of veterans who are highly effective individuals, who are operating within their strength base, and are the message to Garcia types who will get in touch with higher you know, yeah, but like kind of after the, uh, after, after they've already figured it out, you know, Hey, right. what's up? Had a problem with this. Here's how I fixed it. Just wanted to report how we could fix it overall throughout the company. Those mm-hmm. are the messages that they're seeing. And to be honest with you, in some occasions I've actually encountered where veterans are interviewing for positions and the the individuals that they're interviewing with, the managers that they interview with within their two or three, you know, that they got to do, they'll right. they'll blacklist the guy because they're threatened by him. Like, no, yeah. that dude's going to have my job in the next three years, <clears throat> you know, or even sooner. So, yeah, man. Well, what me, do you... and a, me and a buddy of mine, he was a corpsman out with, with First Tank. He applied, you know, me and him both went to the – take the firefighter test for Jefferson County personnel board here in, here in Alabama. Yeah. And you know, he wound up passing and I passed the first part and the second part is a structured interview. And the way the structured interview works is you get seven situational questions 
and then you have secondary questions, a secondary question to go along with. You have two minutes to answer each question, you know, at a time. Mm-hmm. And like one of them, for instance, was say, you know, your work, you, you got hired on your rookie and your best friend was a girl she got hired on as well. And, you know, she's become very destructive uh, who, you know, let herself go and, you know, just being like very smart mouth, not do what she's supposed to do. You know, as a friend, what do you do? Well, me being the, you know, leadership type, you know, and experience the whole, you know, everything from the Marine Corps. I said, well, first off, I would, you know, try to pull up, you know, pull off the side and say, hey, what's going on? You know, what's bothering you? Is everything okay? Because, you know, everybody somehow, some way is going through some type of issues, you know, no matter if it's financial, you know, family, spousal, whatnot. And I said, if she can't, you know, she doesn't want to talk to me, that I would go to my higher chain of command and say, hey, look, such and such is going through some issues. You know, we're noticing different changes. She's not doing what she's supposed to. You know, I think, you know, just so that we can make sure she's okay, somebody needs to talk to her or maybe see a chaplain or something. Would you know that that was not the right answer to to, to, to that question? Not even closely. The overall aspect of trying to be a firefighter in a personnel board situation is all about chain of command. Who's going to be a snitch? Who's not? All that stuff like that. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Really? Like, I think it's so rigged because it asks for what would you do? It didn't say what would the what would the fire department do? What would you do? Well, I'm so it's like a mi- so it's like a does. misconception of of the whole entire testing process period, and that's what like pisses me off about the whole process. Hey, what's up, brother? Hey, buddy, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing well. There he is. So st- I mean, that's that's what legalism kind of does, though, for us. I mean, you see it seep in everywhere. It's oh, like yeah. all this finger pointing, and then it gets in a government government spreads it into like because i mean they get paid it's a government institution so they gotta you, they gotta fit the rules and then so that's it that's how it breaks yep. down hey brad Mop. brad i wanted to, sorry i just wanted to jump right in uh in the matter of full disclosure i wanted you to know that we have pressed the record button okay i don't hold anything back and y'all know that very well put it all out there right like on I said everybody Everybody's got to hear the truth, and they got to hear it from a you know from a first person point of view of stuff. So hey, absolutely, get it on out there. Well, awesome. Okay, so like, what have you been up to since you transitioned out of the core? Uh, I got out and I got hired on with a company called United States Steel. Uh, they used to be the world's largest steel maker company, and I think now they're like the tenth biggest. But in America, they're the second biggest steel making company. Uh, I am what's called on at the QBOP, which is quiet blast operation process. Um, I'm on the hot side of operations. We process the steel. Um, it's a molted at a molted state, very hot, an average temperature between 2,900 and 3,100 degrees processed by the time it gets to me. Now I work at something called a skimmer shack. You have a 400, 400-ton ladle that's got all this, met, this hot molten metal that's been processed from a furnace. Uh, which has got different alloys in it. It gets to me, and I have this big boom called a skimmer, and I skim all this extra slag that they put on it to kind of keep the heat down. Uh, I get all the impurities, uh, all that extra crap that doesn't need to be on there before it goes to a caster. Uh, Either it's made out of a slab or it's made of pipe. We won't really necessarily know unless, you know, the furnace says, hey, this is what we're going to make. We're going to make a a slab steel, or we're going to make a, a what we call a bloom, which is a pipe. It, that's either your natural gas pipe, your galvanized pipe, sewer pipe, you know, et cetera. And I will add alloys as well. We'll put aluminum, we'll put magnesium, carbon, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, it's a hot job. It's a very compressed job, and it's a very demanding job. And, I mean, it's fun, but uh, it's coming to an end because – uh, blast furnaces are being weeded out, and most steel companies are going to what's called electric arc furnace. Okay. So wow. with electric arc furnace, you do away with coke and all your extra stuff, and it's just solid scrap. One charge of a arc furnace could power your house for 10 years. Can you believe that? Holy Christmas. Yeah. Jesus, man. That's intense. <laughs> So, okay, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, in the core, you're a radio 
operator, right? Or com, Bubba? I was. I was. I was a radio. I was the pogue of all pogues. Uh, <laughs> Get was, the was, fuck was, out. I, <laughs> <laughs> fucking kicked the... indoors with <laughs> us. What the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, I have to tell guys that all the time because I'll tell them calm. I'm like, yeah, hey, you're a pogue. I'm like, yeah, you're right. Tell me something I don't know. But uh, <laughs> Jesus. No, I, I had the pleasure of serving with you fine gentlemen and busting some heads wide open and uh, kicking the shit out of people. So it's all good. Hell yes. No, I spent, uh, I spent eight and a half years in the Corps. I did five deployments. I did three to Iraq and two to Afghanistan. Uh, two, I went with uh, three seven weapons, yut yut, and then I went with uh, third line of reconnaissance, Charlie Company, to uh, up in the Nineveh province, and then to Helmand province twice in Afghanistan. Where in Helmand were you? I was in Kajaki and Sangin. We were down at I was at Payne and Castle. Okay, right on. That's yeah. awesome, brother. Right. Hell yes! I didn't realize. Oh, yeah. Dude, I, I was still kicking it after I left. I mean, I left and went to the depot for a few months. Actually, me and a few guys left left 3-7 and then went to the depot to kind of have escape, you know, time for a little bit, but it didn't pan out too well because we got sent back to the fleet. Uh, well, I got sent back to the fleet, fleet very quickly. I think within a matter of, like, four months, I wow. went back to the stumps again. Jesus. And sat out there again. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking hell. I got the short end of the stick, I guess you can say. All right, so how long have you been out now? I got out in December of 2012. All right, so you're still in in that, like, like freshly out, like, phase. Like, how, how has it been thus far, like, overall? Like, not as far as, like, what you've been doing for work, but just your, your state, like, you been doing all right? You know, it, it's been a process because, you know, coming back home, you know, you, you know, you hear, you know, your friends aren't who they used to be and blah, 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 blah. And, and that's kind of the truth because, you know, everybody that even before I got the Marine Corps or even while I was in, you know, would talk to and you know, I kind of gave them all up because, you know, they I guess their expectations were, hey, why aren't you calling me? Why aren't you this? And I pretty much told them to go screw themselves and kind of. Gave up on them, but I mean, I have people I talk to. Uh, you know, I'll go to the VA and you know hang out, and I've got people in my church and people I work with that were you know Marines, and we'll socialize and you know have a cold drink here and there and just talk. You know, just let crap out and just talk about random crap. But uh, it's been, I guess you could say, it's been tough because you know, especially getting to see everybody I was close to for so long and. The only way I get to see him now is either on Facebook or a phone call or, you know, whatnot. But, uh, or a podcast interview. Yeah, or a podcast interview. <laughs> <laughs> it's a new one, by the way. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, I guess it's slowly getting better. I mean, things kind of changed when I had, you know, when me and my wife gave birth to my little daughter, which she will be two in September, and nice. she's my everything, man. I mean, she, uh, congrats, dude. Yes. I, I, I think, uh, the only time that I'm extremely sensitive is whenever I'm around her, because when she falls, like I'm like running like the speed of a freaking of a jackrabbit, like as fast as I can, trying to get her and hold her, and make sure she's okay. So call me pussy if you want to. Excuse my language, but oh, no. <laughs> don't worry about it on here, man. This the is... FCC ain't got shit on this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, trust me, I'm trying to keep this as rated G as possible. But if not, we can jump this thing into rated R. Oh yeah, don't worry about that at all, man. <laughs> We're rated as explicit. I do that for little baby ears in case they start clicking through the web. Yeah, we're good. Yeah, we're set, man. You can say whatever the fuck you want. We were talking about the glass factory on here at one point. Oh, hey, that's a uh, yeah, that's a freak. That's a subject right there in itself. Fucking a, because that's but uh, well, it's funny because that's the thing, right? You know what I mean? It's kind of like all right, whatever you would normally talk about in a Marine Corps lounge. That's it right there. It's just... Like, for for instance, when I left the fleet, I went over to Quantico. Quantico's the crossroads of the Marine Corps, and I found out for a very good reason why. Out of the CMTs that were on the hill with me, I mean, 
we hit at each different base. That's the easiest way to put it. They came from Pendleton, Cherry Point, Lejeune, Lejeune. The, Lejeune. You know what I'm saying? So it was yeah. it was a hodgepodge. Uh, but also, you would go walking into a lounge, and a guy would be like, you know, talking about, I don't know, just the most off-the-wall, crazy, fucked-up shit, how he pissed on a couch over the weekend or something <laughs> like that. You know? So... That's what we're all about. It's the, uh, it's, it's what you're doing, man. It's exactly what you're doing. We just happened to press record. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny how you talk about, you know, with, with every, the glass factory. Uh, you remember our last appointment to Ramadi? Yeah, no, uh, seven. We, we had, you know, that, um, that chlorine tank go off that hit the backside of uh, Blue Diamond. Yeah. Yep. The pink mist that went everywhere. You know what's crazy was, you remember their MO, our MO, Eric Goodspeed, Lieutenant Goodspeed? Yeah. yeah. He sent me a video that he made, uh, and I'm glad that you remind like I said that because I'm going to send that to y'all. The only way I can send it is via Facebook, but I'm going to send that to y'all and look at it, dude. Yeah, he's doing some amazing stuff, huh? Dude, I... I didn't know that he got that close to so much stuff. Like, I never could tell. But, uh, yeah, he sent me a video of it, and, and like, two times that apparently he had a camera roll, and I never freaking knew about it because I'm sitting there just blabbing my jaws. <laughs> <laughs> you of course you were. You orate. You'd, you'd come up and have speeches for us. <laughs> it was like I would, what, it was I would, what, speaking I, time with yeah. Ivy. Yeah, I know it. It was fantastic. Hey, yeah. y'all, I'm going to fuck you up if you fuck up the CYZ-10. That oh, was I one of my favorites. I used so bad it was unreal. I'm like, dude, <laughs> You're breaking up again, brother. <laughs> but I like that last line. That was a good one. That's the other thing, too. I don't know if you realize this as well, but at the end of every one of our episodes, our good man, Justin here works very hard to edit some funnies into the end of every episode. So we always like telling our listeners, don't forget about the outtakes. Oh, man. Yeah, dude. It's just leave everybody off with a little bit of a smile on their face. Just tell them that if they don't like it, they can go grab them a disco biscuit, light that bitch up, and look like a Pink Floyd concert. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, yes. Hey, so what do you think of this concept? Because this happens as you progress. You might be too early into civilianhood, but how have your stories changed? Like, have you noticed a narrowing down of the ones that, like, were the most meaningful to you being on your on your mind? And then when people bring up other ones, you're like, oh, shit, yeah, that one meant something to me, too. You know what's funny is probably the only two deployments that really – like I can, I pretty much talk about all the time. Of course, it's Fort Tac Six, and then, and then my first deployment to Afghanistan. Uh, only because, I mean, they're, I guess they were the biggest life changers, or like the biggest things that stick in the back of my mind the most. I mean, yeah, Fort Tac Six, I guess is, you know, we can, you know, us three definitely can relate to that because, I mean, it was, you know, we lost good friends, and of course, all the bullshit we went through and the. The countless blow-ups, the countless QRF calls, and the, you know, just everything, you know. It was a, and then, of course, my first one to Afghanistan was kind of a big deal because that was when we went down to the, uh, down to the Pakistan border and around Baram Cha, which I think, Mike, you might have heard of Baram Cha several times. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, my unit was a part of that whole blockade on the border while the infamous SEALs, to Pakistan to get Osama bin Laden. Uh, that was kind of crazy because there was a lot of resistance. Jeez. I guess, yeah, that's, that's about the only two deployments I can actually say that really stick in the back of my mind all the time. Yeah, that makes sense to me, definitely. See, I'm the exact same way. First deployment to Iraq, first deployment to Afghanistan. So I, I know what you mean right there. Matter of fact, I had a shout out to our fellow Iraqistan vets. Because it's, uh, I, I don't know if you saw this, but it felt like an entirely different battlefield. And yet, it felt like a similar 
elusive enemy. At least that's what I encountered. Probably because I was in a truck all through Ramadi, and then I was foot mobile all through Afghanistan. You know, we were bouncing around in Humvees every once in a while, but we were definitely foot yeah. mobile for the majority of the time. Yeah. Afghanistan, I was in LEVs, LEV-25, so um, we were like damn gypsies, and it was pretty fucking bumpy, but um, we I mean, we did some long hauls a day. I mean, it was an average. We were doing 100K, you know, south, periodically. Oh, did we lose him entirely? I think we lost him. Wait, I, I hear. Oh, do you, you got me? Yeah, there, there you is. go. So, you're, so you were in uh, LEVs when you were in Hellman? Yeah. Dude, that's gnarly. What was that like? Uh, it was bumpy. <laughs> Do they get better ventilation now than they used to? I, I heard that they were pretty bad back in the day. Well, I'm going to tell you this. You know, I was lucky enough. I got to, you know, stand outside the scout hatch. Uh, me and the chief scout, you know, pop out of the scout hatch. And, of course, the other than the dust, I mean, it was pretty good ventilation. Now, wintertime, when it was cold as shit, uh, it seemed like all that exhaust was coming inside more than out. Yeah, that's it was, like I said, it's good right now. I'm gonna tell you something, y'all, cra something crazy. Uh, my last deployment to Afghanistan, Colonel Turner was fifth Marine Regimental Commander and yeah. also in charge of RCT. Uh, wow, that's crazy. I was actually in, uh, I was in one five for my last unit in the fleet, and uh, really, old three seven, no shit, Lieutenant Colonel oh, yeah. Turner. Come on. Well, he was a yeah, he was a uh, colonel. You know, when he was regimental commander, but yeah, I bumped into him in the street shortly before I EAS. But yeah, very good guy. It's crazy. He came to cop when he came to Castle. He, I guess, he had asked for me, and I get over there. It's Colonel Turner. I'm like, no shit. And he said three seven. I said, how about that, sir? And of course, it pissed my battalion commander off because we were just sitting there chit chatting and socializing. <laughs> <laughs> Hell so yeah. Bad. Hell but, uh, yes. No shit, three seven. <laughs> exactly what I said. Dude. It pissed him off so bad. Of course, Colonel Turner was like, "Yeah, hey, uh, Jets, uh, I'm gonna talk to Sergeant Ivy. Uh, I'll see you in a minute." You know the little <laughs> voice he does. <laughs> All right, there, Jets. Uh, I'm, 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 I, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to Sergeant Ivy for uh, just a little bit here. Uh, oh. I can't do it anymore. <laughs> My time commander's like face it was just unreal. I, I laughed so hard when he was on. He said. Yeah, I'm sure I just pissed them off because, yeah, I'm going to hear about it later because, oh, no, you're not. Don't worry about it. Like, All right, sir. And we just started chit chatting. That's fantastic, dude. The first words out of his mouth is, why aren't your staff aren't yet? <laughs> How about that? Oh, my God. That's so great. Yeah. Good times, man. I'm telling you. One of my favorite stories with him is, he comes into the hooch and and uh, he's got his note taking gear, and he sits down in the middle of the floor, just cross legged, right next to me. And I was like PFC at the time. And he pulls this red man out of his blouse and he, or yeah, out of his boot blouse and he leans over. He's like, "Hey, want a dip?" I'm like, "Absolutely, sir. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> just you are awesome." And then he gets up and addresses us before, you know, we go on mission, hands on hips, like for the Superman that he, that he is, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, you know, we rolled out the, the hooch. I'm like, dude, that guy's awesome. Just a great guy to be around, to be honest with you. Good times, I man. Tell you, what, you know, his whole entire thing, I mean, he, you know, he had his hands on his hips. He had the big old chaw in and, uh, what was funny was whenever he stood up in the crowd and he leaned over and said, that Marine needs to wake up before I spit in his face. Died laughing as hard as I could. And I was like, I would never think in a million years a, a colonel would say some crap like that. But who the hell is going to say anything different to it? You know? Right. <laughs> and I was like, this, this kid's about to get murdered. Like, <laughs> With a knife hand. Uh... With a knife hand and a dip in his face. Wow. <laughs> Oh, oh Jesus! Fuck. It was epic, man. It was fucking epic. Oh my God! No shit, three seven. You remember the first time he said no shit, three seven? Everyone's like, three seven, <laughs> and we all thought it was weird for a little bit, and then all of a sudden, like one time, everyone like sarcastically just screamed it out, and he's like, "No, we can do better than that." And then yeah. all of a sudden, like it became this thing, and everyone would just scream it as loud as possible. 
yep. out of like this belligerence. <laughs> Dude, speaking of belligerence, I caught a poser at the uh, la- not this past Saturday, but the Saturday before at the Dirk Bentley concert. Speaking of which, I got to meet Dirk Bentley. Very awesome dude, by the way. Very laid back. Cool. Uh, this kid in a Marine Corps t-shirt, all right? And I went up to him. I said, Semper Fidelis. And he looks at me and says, what does that mean? Oh. And I said, I said, are you a Marine? He said, yeah, why? And I looked at my wife, and she looked at me, and I handed her my beer. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best way to start that. I said, uh, what unit are you with? I'm with the first of the 501. <laughs> Hold on. You know, I'm like, I'm like, oh, I don't know what to do. Wait, well, I do not do this. So I said, are you fucking me right now? And he said, what do you mean? I said, is that a special forces unit or something, Marine Corps? He said, oh, yeah. Uh, and and now this time, I'm out of control. Casey's trying to, my wife's trying to grab me and pull me backwards. I'm, like, slinging her off of me. There's two other guys. Hey, man, it's not worth it. I'm like, oh, it's fucking worth it, all right? This dude's face is about to get bashed the fuck in. <laughs> the whole entire time, I'm screaming, I'm cussing. All these girls are, like, screaming because they think there's about to be a fucking mass murder attack or something. And I'm, like, trying to put my hands on this dude so bad. And I'm like, you fuckers, you motherfuckers, I'm going to fucking kill you. I was like, you don't fucking treat, you act like one of my brothers. You'll never be like one of my brothers. I'm like, take that fucking t-shirt off, you sorry son of a bitch, and I'm, I'm going. Well, then here comes the cops. And they're like, what's going on? I'm like, this motherfucker needs to be arrested for imposing as a fucking Marine. I'm a, I'm a fucking Marine. This motherfucker's not no damn Marine. I said, I asked him specifically, and he wants to fucking lie about it. And then he's like, I'm, I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. I, I'm really not a Marine. I was just trying to get some of the special parts. And I'm, oh, oh, oh. oh man. I'm trying to grab this dude's face because I want to murder him so bad. Well, they wind up taking me out, and they're trying to calm me down. I was like, get that motherfucker out of here before I kill him. Well, then I see two other guys in Marine Corps T-shirts. And I'm like, please tell me there's not two more that I'm about to go to right. prison for. And the dude's like, what's going on, Marine? Are you okay? And I said, like, who the fuck are you? And this dude's like, man, I've, look, I've been out a while. I'm Corporal such and such. This other dude's mouth staff sergeant such and such. I'm like, that motherfucker in there is being stupid trying to pose as one of us. And they're like <laughs> trying to go in there, and there's two cops grabbing them, trying to pull them out. And they're like <laughs> escorting this dude out safely. I'm like, you're dead. I fucking see you. I'm going to fucking kill you. <laughs> Never saw him after that. Oh, ooh, it was so mad. Well. Luckily, the whole setup of the VIP lounge like bought all of us, got all of us alcohol to try to calm us down. It was like, hey, look, I'm sorry for everything. I appreciate y'all's service. And I'm like, I can't believe this motherfucker. Did he honestly think he's not going to run into any vets or guys that are still in to this day? Is he fucking stupid? <laughs> right? What I love is that the VIP section tried to calm you guys down by giving you alcohol. Yes. <laughs> they obviously don't know what Marines do. Held. Oh, dear God. Here, drink some more. That'll help. Dude, my wife was so embarrassed. Like, she was like, I don't even know you. I'm like, babe, you don't get it. This shit's going around fucking daily. Like, motherfuckers trying to impose. And I said, I'm sick of that shit. And I said, what set me off the most is, I'm just trying to get some of the perks. <gasps> oh, Jesus. For the love of God, please tell me you were fucking just the perks. Please tell me I heard that. Somebody else talking about the spark perks and general somebody's parking titties or something. I don't know. Uh, oh man, I. Oof. That's the yeah. worst right there. It's that's like the full line admission something. of that's guilt. The problem. Titles actually mean something. Exactly. People I'm don't. like, dude. And that's what I told the cop. I was like, you can't honestly believe that. Well, I said, actually, yeah, you can believe that somebody would show up like this and and and, and act stupid. To try. I said, especially after the Chattanooga shooting. That a motherfucker would do some shit like this. This Jesus. was this was th- like what four days in Chattanooga shooting, and this motherfucker's wearing a Marine Corps t-shirt, Marine Corps shorts, and had the fucking balls to say, "I'm just trying to get some of the part." Jesus Christ, dude! All right, America, you you have it. I mean, that's what it is. If you if you're gonna fucking go around and poke a bear, don't expect the bear not to get pissed off. If you're gonna be fucking stupid like that. Don't expect not to get people pissed off enough to fight you. And it's your fault, America, when you do that. And when you don't hold those people accountable. Dude, it's ridiculous. It's it's not even a matter of having to be law. It's a matter of what's right. 
Are you, you're seriously going to fucking lie about something like that? Really? You have that little integrity? Grow the fuck up. And I, if, if this doesn't pertain to you, obviously it doesn't pertain to you. But seriously, like, I just want some of the perks. You think that's, like, worth the stress that you put an individual under? Because the title Marine, especially, and I love saying this, is bestowed upon us for the rest of our lives. It's by congressional order. It's the only one. So especially in that regard, I mean, everyone everyone deserves that, that same level of, like, understanding. Because, I mean, really, like, when other veterans around, like, you're, you're a lot more comfortable. And so to also take advantage of that by wearing, like, you take advantage of, of a part of us that is the best part. It's that comfort. It's that... It's that ability to actually just let down your guard just a little bit because, hey, my brothers are around. You know, whether they're Air Force, Navy, Army, whatever, you know? And when you impersonate that, it's like it's like messing with that radar. It's like, well, now, like, it's like I got to walk around and be like, hey, are you a veteran? Like, let me fucking, let me gauge you now because everyone can get the shit at an Army, Navy surplus store and they have no... I don't know what like. Well, it de- it degrades the sense also of it. It kind of prevents me, so to, so to speak, prevents me from wanting to go out and rock like a Marine Corps T-shirt. Right. I can back it up proudly. I'll go out in town wearing my unit T-shirts, but a generic Marines T-shirt. And then is a guy going to walk up to me and be like, "No"? If they do walk up to me and ask me whether or not I served in the Marine Corps, I'd say, "Yeah, brother." You know, give my years and what units I was with. That's it. Right. You know, yeah, I was out in the stumps, bro. Who doesn't, yeah. who, you find me a Marine right now who doesn't know what the stumps is. They're either a boot or they're not a Marine. Right. It's that simple. You know? You know, <clears throat> not to mention, I mean, I didn't get, I, I didn't get VIP tickets or anything because I, because I was a Marine. I got VIP tickets because I bought them. And you what know, was what was your meet. perk? What was your perk again, Brad? Now that we, because you said something right there. Perk? Yep. What was your perk for joining the Marine Corps? Oh, I earned the title. And you just said a line there that I'm trying to get you to repeat. You got what? A Marine to the left and to the right of you. I've got brothers that are left and right of me that have earned their title. All right, all one big family. That's perk enough as well. I didn't get VIP tickets by perk. I bought my VIP ticket. You know what I'm saying? Right. Absolutely. Hell yes. All right, brother, we're going to wrap it up right there. Brad Ivey, thank you so much for being a guest here on Cigars and Sea Stories. Cannot thank you enough for your time. It has been a, it has been fantastic talking with you. Hey, you guys are taking ass, taking names. I applaud for what you guys are doing. Uh, I look forward to hearing more of the show. Heck, I even look forward to being on it again, if possible, later on down the road. Absolutely. Uh, oh, hell yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Marines, Corman, you want to be a guest on the show, get a hold of us, cigarsandseastories.com. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. Your comments literally make the show. Tell us who you want to hear from. If you want to be a guest, get in touch with us. Uh, who should we interview next? If you're a civilian, go ahead and ask Brian the Civvy those, Q- those Q&A questions, and we'll get to them. Thank you so much. Cue the music. All right. Hey, and we're out, man. Semper Fidelis. Ruh. All right. I've got to shit and get the fuck out of here. <laughs>